Welcome, everybody. This is the Frontiers in Brain Health talk series, where we take a deep dive into some of the most exciting research in brain and behavior. Um, and I feel like this is just heating up. We've still got actually three more of these talks coming in later November and December, so stay tuned for those. I'm Dan Krawczyk. I'm the deputy director here at the center, as well as a professor in psychology at UT Dallas. And uh, this will be a recorded talk. We have a virtual audience as well as the in-person. Um, if you're virtual and would like to ask a question, we will have time at the end for questions. So please use the Q&A function to, uh, to basically say anything. You can do that anytime during the talk. Um, the Center for Brain Health is a research center uh, coming from the background of cognitive neuroscience, and we're devoted to studying brain plasticity. Um, neuroplasticity, which impacts everything we do. And we will talk some about the uh, signature groundbreaking breaking study, the Brain Health Project, at the end um, as well. And one of the important initiatives that's come up in recent years is called Brain Healthy Workplaces. And several people are very interested in this idea of how can we create workspaces that optimize human performance as well as human well-being and take care of health. And with that theme in mind, we have an excellent speaker today, Dr. Elena Katok, who comes to us from the Jindal School of Management at UT Dallas, just north of here in Richardson. Um, Dr. Katok is a pioneer in behavioral operations management, which is a discipline studying how human behavior impacts our business practices. So incredibly relevant um, for, for many of us across many disciplines. She has an experimental economics background, and she, with Gary Bolton, uh, founded and runs the Lab for Behavioral Operations and Economics, the LBOE, up at campus. And I encourage you to check out their website if you're interested in their work further. Um, she started her academic career at UC Berkeley, where she did her, her bachelor's. Then she did it both an MBA and a PhD at Penn State. Uh, before going on to be faculty at Penn State at the Smeal College of Business um, before coming to UT Dallas 10 years ago. She holds the Ashok and Monica Mago Distinguished Professorship in Management, and she's going to tell us about risk today, which is an incredibly relevant topic uh, broadly, but I think especially communication of risk has been top of mind since 2020 and continues to be. So we look forward to an incredibly relevant, exciting talk by Elena K. Talk. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you very much, Dan, for that introduction. And uh, thank you for having me. This is a real pleasure to, uh, to give uh, this talk to um, a very different audience than uh, I uh, usually talk to. So um, today I'm going to uh, tell you about two studies um, that are related and that are part of a bigger research program that um, I'm working on with um, Gary Bolton, um, who is also a professor. He is an economist at the Jindal uh, School of Management um, here at UTD and the co-director of our, of our laboratory. So um, I will talk about um, how to communicate um, advice and recommendations that have to do with, uh, you know, that involve risky decisions. And uh, the research program here is basically how do you get people to follow advice from experts. So um, the vehicle for studying this um, is the cost-loss game. Right, and, and the uh, cost-loss trade-off is really involved in many decisions that we make in life, right? So for example, you know, if there is a hurricane or some weather event coming, uh, there may be advice to um, ev evacuate, right? And people, of course, uh, can uh, follow this advice or not. And um, there is a cost to evacuating. There is also a risk, um, but you know, the storm could pass and uh, not do any damage. And that way, you know, if you didn't actually follow the advice, you may end up uh, better off after the fact. There are some other things like, um, you know, in healthcare, right? So um, healthcare risks, uh, we hear from our, uh, you know, our, our doctor, our, our, our physician, they tell us, 
they give us recommendations for something to do, and again, there is a, a cost-loss trade-off there. Um, we uh, just went through a pandemic, and we've been given a lot of advice you know, about uh, various aspects uh, that have to do, you know, that had to do with COVID-19. And uh, there have been, you know, a lot of discussion about whether this advice, you know, should be followed or not, or, uh, you know, why is it that sometimes this advice changes, right? Um, and this, this is also something that uh, we, we deal with, uh, well, that we use as a, as, as a motivation for this uh, work that I'm going to talk about. Okay. Um, so usually when advice, when experts give advice to uh, non-experts, it's um, kind of, it's given in terms of absolute, right? So you should evacuate, right? Or you should, uh, you know, get vaccinated or you should um, have a medical procedure, right? And the discussion of trade-offs is often secondary. Sometimes it's non-existent, sometimes it's existent, but it's usually um, in a kind of black and white, right? So, um, uh, you know, the idea that, um, you know, risk, you know, you know, how to effectively communicate risk and trade-offs associated in these decisions is uh, somewhat understudied. So uh, decision makers are typically non-experts, right? So, uh, you know, um, recommendation can be based on, you know, on a model. Typically these models uh, are, are complicated. Uh, people who have to make the actual decisions, you know, are non-experts, so they don't understand how these models work. So in some sense, these models can be a black box, um, but they provide guidance. Uh, and uh, so this idea of how do you communicate expert guidance to non-expert users is the idea here behind our, um, th this set of studies that I will talk about. Um, and, and the important thing is that m often there is um, quantitative information involved. Oh, should I turn off the other one? Sorry. Okay. Yeah, hold it up to your... Like this? Oh, okay, all <laughs> right, that's, that's a little weird. All right, um, so, uh, yes, so transmitting quantitative information to um, people who are, are, are non-experts is, is the idea here. Um, so sometimes, I mean, I mean, usually very often when uh, quantitative information is um, transmitted, it's transmitted in terms of point uh, forecasts or recommendations, right, rather than um, com trying to communicate probabilities. It's a, sometimes they're verbal statements, right, so like uh, saying that something is extremely likely, right, so today, you know, we're having uh, some weather, and uh, you know, I heard that there may be, uh, you know, some hail, right? But I don't know, you know, I don't know if I'm when I'm going to drive home from here, you know, whether there is going to be hail or not, right? So I haven't really been given probability of um, of this event, uh, and there are some reasons for avoiding it. So um, one of the reasons is that. Uh, people may not be able to use uh, quantitative information properly. Uh, another uh, reason is that if we actually talk about uncertainty, this may seem like, um, you know, we're trying to have it both ways, right, as experts. So rather than, you know, being definitive, we are, um, you know, trying to hedge, and perhaps this could damage the credibility of the forecaster. Um, 
but on the other hand, ignoring uncertainty can also uh, damage credibility, especially over time. So, you, because the forecasts are not always correct. I mean, this is the nature of the things. If we could make forecasts that are 100% correct, we wouldn't need to be studying it, right? So, forecasts are, are sometimes wrong, um, and um, uh, acknowledging that may actually improve credibility. So, that's... Uh, the trade-offs in terms of uh, how you communicate forecasts. So this is a vehicle for uh, studying this big problem. It's a kind of a uh, very focused and, 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 and small game. This is called the cost-loss game. Um, so essentially the decision maker in this game uh, has a decision to either take a risk or take the cost and I have parameters uh, on the slide that um, are used in the experiment. So the, what is known is that the average probability of the, of the loss, P, is it's on average 50%, but in any given uh, setting, it might be, you know, it, it, it might be between zero and one. So you could uh, take the cost, which is uh, 75, or you could take the risk and basically take your chances uh, where you might lose um, 100 with probability P or on the other hand, you might not lose anything, right? With probability one minus P. So, um, so this is a cost loss game and um, uh, it's an individual decision task. Uh, and this is the vehicle for studying um, the problem. Now, the, what's a nice thing about this simple problem is that there is an optimal policy. This is actually very simple, uh, right? So essentially, if you're risk neutral, then uh, you weigh the cost and benefits, right? So if, if P times loss is less than the cost, then you take a risk and otherwise you take the cost. Right now, if you're risk averse, you might uh, be able to, you, you, you know, you might be willing to pay a slightly higher cost than, you know, the, than P times loss, um, you know, if you if you don't like risk. But that is basically the idea, right? So that is. Um, uh, so it's a problem where we know what the optimal solution is, and uh, we're going to study it in the laboratory with um, with human subjects that are um, you know in an incentive compatible set of experiments where uh, people um, are paid money uh, based on how they do right based on um, on how they do in this task so um, okay, so let me define a couple of things which are going to be important uh, throughout this uh, this talk. So, um, in a game like this, um, what we're calling the status quo action is basically if you didn't know p, right? So, if you if all you knew is that p is between zero and one with average of fifty percent, what would you do? You know. In, in this game, right? And so like with these numbers, you would take the risk, right? Because, uh, you know, 0.5 times 100 is 50 and the cost is 75, right? So you're better off on average taking the risk. So, the, so taking the risk here in this example is the status quo action. And then what we're calling the siren action is the opposite of status quo action, right? And so siren, it's like, you know, an alarm, right? So if, uh, you know, if, if, if there is a hurricane coming, for example, you know, your status quo may be, well, you, you know, I'm going to stay in my house and, uh, wait it out, but you know if it's really bad, so there is a siren action that you know uh, that tells me to evacuate, right? So that is something. So that so that would involve in that case taking a cost. Okay, so uh, this is uh, I'm going to talk about two studies. So this is the um, the first study that's called uh, that, that is joint work with Gary Bolton. Um, on um, basically how do you uh, present uncertainty information uh, to people in a cost-loss game in a way that they would, they would follow it. So the idea is you want people to comply with this uh, forecast guidance and uh, you want to understand how to most effectively present it. 
All right. So uh, this was the, um, the the game, and um, I should just say a little bit about our methods. So we um, use human subjects, and uh, typically they're students. So in this in this case, they were students. Uh, but sometimes they might be non-students. So in the second study, for example, uh, this was done online uh, in, a, in a wider um, population. So um, the nice thing, as I said, you know that the optimal we, we know what the optimal solution is in this game. We know we can make a clear statement about uncertainty, right? So P represents uncertainty. There is no ambiguity, for example. You know, so it's just uncertainty. Um, and, uh, of course, the downside is that um, learning about reliability may be difficult for, um, for participants. Uh, so, one idea here, and this is kind of what uh, would typically be done, is we can you know, if we, if we wanted to offer decision support, we can uh, offer a recommendation, right? So this would be a, a clear guidance uh, where we tell them what to do, right? As opposed to probability where we're just giving them the information that they need to find out what the optimal decision is, right? So the, the guidance is clear, but um, sometimes the recommendation might be wrong, as I said. Uh, this idea that uh, you know forecasts are not perfect. Um, okay, so we're essentially looking at these two options uh, of what kind of information to provide, right? And uh, what we want to know is: are recommendations more effective than probabilities? Um, so this is uh, our experiment. We basically had two conditions, the high loss, the, the high cost and the low cost condition. And they differ only in, in the cost, right? So in the high cost condition, it was 75. In the low cost condition, it was 25. And what that does is it changes, kind of it flips the status quo in the siren action, right? So in the high cost condition, the status quo action is to take the risk, while in the low cost condition, the status quo action is to take the cost. Okay? So that's an important point here. Okay, and then we have uh, four uh, treatments uh, in these two conditions. So altogether, there are going to be eight, um, uh, eight um, treatments, um, right? So there is what we call the climate treatment. Uh, condition or baseline where we don't give people either recommendation or probability and so all they know is that p on average is going to be 0.5 right now they play multiple times in fact in our in our studies they play a hundred times um, so they will um, observe these probabilities um, so that's uh, the baseline, and then uh, there are three treatments where we give them probability, so every round we give them P, okay? Uh, or in the recommendation uh, condition, we give them uh, the recommendation, right? So every round we tell them uh, whether to take the risk or take the cost. And then finally, uh, in, the, in the fourth condition, we give them both. Uh, so uh, as I said, in the high cost, the status quo is to take the risk. Uh, and the siren action is to take the cost, right? And so you, 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 essentially you take the siren action when the probability is high enough. So if it's above 0 0.75, then uh, the siren, then the optimal decision would be to take, uh, to take the cost. Uh, and in the low cost, it's the opposite. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the status quo action is to take the cost, but if the probability is uh, low enough, so if it's lower than 0.25, then um, we're going to take the risk. All right, uh, so I'm going to show the result of the high cost treatment, and the results of the low cost treatments are, are very similar except flipped. So, um, yeah. All right, so what we're looking at here are uh, on, on the x axis, we have the decision number, which is 1 to 100, right? So every Every participant played a um, hundred times, and um, 
on the y-axis we have the average number of people who um, who took the siren action right which in in you know in, in the high cost condition the siren action was to take the cost right and so uh, now if you uh, think about this in the in the neither condition so this is our climate condition uh, nobody should have taken the cost right and uh, in fact people about 25 percent of people did right uh, in these kind of experiment often you observe something like this so if the optimal decision you know is uh, what we call it, uh, is a corner point solution right so like everybody should do something people never you know everybody never does you know the same thing and so there is always um, you know errors and these errors can only be in one direction so in the neither condition um, people you know, it's 25% instead of zero. Now, in the probability condition, um, what we see is that when people are supposed to take um, the cost, they don't take it 100% of the time, although in certain rounds they do, as you can see here in the in the white um, the white dots in the probability only condition, right? And then when they're supposed to uh, take um, the cost they also do that but again not always but only uh, uh, 25 percent of the time in or, or well 75 percent of the time instead of 100 so so, so, so so it looks fairly you know symmetrical in the probability condition now the interesting thing here is that in the recommendation condition the effectiveness of uh, the recommendation to take the siren action is lower than in the probability condition. Uh, is there a, I don't know if, I don't, this is probably not visible, but um, yeah, so, well, maybe I can, I can show it this way. So in the recommendation treatment, uh, this is the one I'm talking about here. Um, so uh, when we don't give people probability, their um, compliance with the siren action is lower, right, than if we do give them probability. And then if we give them both recommendation and probability, then it seems that uh, the improvement, you, you, you know, it, it improves uh, back to the level uh, of the probability treatment. Now, with the... Um, with the status quo action, it's the opposite. So, so, so probability is less effective in taking the status quo action, right? And recommendation is more effective. So, um, this is another way. So, this is looking at the aggregate, right? So, we see that um, you know, if we if, if we compare the two uh, red bars here, so this is the difference between. Uh, the siren action, the compliance with the siren action in the, um, you know, between the probability and the recommendation condition. And so it goes down, right? So probabilities are better at, uh, than recommendation at inducing the siren action. And uh, looking at the status quo, we see that the improvement here is in the opposite direction. So recommendations are better than probability at inducing the status quo action. Uh, when you have both of them, uh, you are getting almost the best of both worlds, although not quite. Okay, uh, so the, the, the focus of that paper was uh, what, uh, you know, why is it, why are recommendation not as effective at uh, inducing the siren action? And the reason that we um, think is responsible for this is the cry wolf effect so the fact that recommendations are sometimes wrong decreases the trust that users have in those recommendations so i'm not going to go into great detail here in the interest of time but basically when we run a regression where we measure the cry wolf effect by uh, kind of looking at the cumulative number of times that people observe the recommendation having been wrong we see that it does cause the compliance to decrease, right? And it uh, decreases in the direction that uh, we observed here in the aggregate data. So Cry-Wolf effect is larger for recommendations and probability. Um, 
Okay, and um, yeah, so that's the main point here, and this is a summary of this first study, um, is that decision, maker, um, decision makers value, uh, um, they derive value from having a forecast, right? And for the siren action, uh, the forecast compliance is higher when you give them probabilities, so it's more effective to give them probability than just recommendation. Uh, and the reason is the cry wolf effect. So the implication, you know, the practical implication is that it's a good idea to give people some measure of uncertainty when we are making recommendations. All right, so the second study looks at individual characteristics. So we're trying to understand more about how individual characteristics, in, in this case numeracy, uh, affect uh, the effectiveness of various ways to communicate information, right? Uh, so essentially the effectiveness of, um, um, of the forecast. And again, so we, we're looking at recommendation and probability like in the other study. So what we've done here is, um, so we measured people's numeracy. Now in general, uh, numeracy skills in the population vary a lot. And we see that they're actually fairly stable. So this is a graph you know, that shows them in 1992 and 2003. And we see that um, you know, they haven't changed a hell of a lot, right? So I guess numeracy in, improved a little bit. You know, uh, you know, over uh, that time frame, but not that much, right? So about, uh, you know, about a third of the people, you know, are in the intermediate level, uh, a third of the people at the basic level, and, uh, you know, the, the percentage of proficient is about 13%. So what decreased a little bit is the below basic level um, of numeracy. Um, and of course, uh, People, you know, remember that the decision makers are, you know, they're regular people in the population. So they have various degree of numeracy. Right. Okay. So the experimental design, um, we ran this uh, on a uh, kind of, a, we designed this, we redesigned this game and um, implemented it um, uh, so that people can play it on the phone. So this is how uh, the interface looks, uh, right? So in the probability treatment, uh, it said something like the loss probability P for this round is 16%, right? Uh, in the recommendation, it says, you know, the advice in this round is to take the risk. And uh, then in the both condition, they got both of these. Uh, these were the four treatments that we had. Um, again, the recommendation, probability, or both, um, and the baseline. And um, this was all done in the high cost condition, right? So remember, that means that the status quo action is to take the risk and the um, siren action is to take the cost. Okay, so uh, because we did this online, we uh, did a knowledge check uh, for you know, the subjects to make sure that they understood the game. So it's something like this, right? Um, uh, in fact, they had to answer all of these correctly before we let them proceed. If they didn't, then they uh, were directed to the end screen and they were just paid the, the fixed amount. Yeah, but they did not participate. Uh, we, measured the, uh, we measured numeracy with the Berlin numeracy test that has these uh, f uh, seven items. And uh, like if you look at this, I don't know if you can read it, but uh, as we go from one to seven, uh, these questions become more difficult, right? So, for example, one, you know, imagine that we flip a coin a thousand times. What is your best guess about how many times the coin would comes up head, you know, from a thousand flips? And and really, you know, if you know people know flipping a coin 50-50, right? So it's 500, right? So this is a very easy question. Then you know it gets a little bit more difficult, right? So in the big uh, box lottery, the chance of winning 10, uh, you know, a $10 prize is 1%. What is your best guess about how many people would win, you know, 10% if a thousand people played, right? So now, the, you know, instead of 50-50, it's 10, it's it's one percent, right? So you have to understand what that means. And then, you know, as we go further down, like the seventh question, basically requires you to calculate conditional probability, right? And so 
probably most people would need a piece of paper to do that if they were going to do it, um, you know, if they didn't get completely conf um, confused. So this was uh, the distribution of the scores of our subjects. Um, so uh, what this is showing, the histogram is showing, you know, the number of subjects who answered out of seven, you know, zero, one, two, three, and so forth, question right. And you can see that it, it kind of looks like a normal uh, distribution, which is what we would expect, right? So we see that the numeracy is quite varied in our subject pool, just like it is in, you know, in the population. So we think that our subject pool in this case is more or less representative of the bigger population. Um, we also, um, this is some other demographic information in terms of age, education, uh, you know, employment, income, and so on. So this was done on MTurk. Um, and uh, of course, we did our best to make sure that there were no bots in, in our in our sample uh, through this uh, knowledge check and the attention checks. Okay, so represent uh, the sample is fairly uh, representative in terms of demographics, um, education. Uh, you know, it's a surprising number of people on MTurk uh, uh, have have a college degree and even even um, graduate degrees. So this is the result. Um, so this graph is it, it's the same uh, thing. Uh, it, it's, it's the same kind of graph as I showed you a few slides ago, uh, right? So on the x-axis is the round number one uh, through a hundred, and on the y-axis is now probability. A proportion of subjects who take the status quo, right? So this is um, high cost condition. The status quo is taking the risk, right? So proportion of subjects who take the risk. Again, now this should be 100% in the baseline, but it's less than that. It's about 75. And then with probability, we get separation. Um, so uh, the probability of taking the status quo, um, it's, it should be 100% here, so the blue line really should be at 100, but it's only at 75. The gray line should be at zero, but it's at a little bit higher than that. As I said, um, you know, corner solution, random errors, that's what we observe. So this is probability. When we give people advice, Again, we're seeing very similar results as, as in the previous study, right? So the, um, the status quo uh, compliance increases and the um, siren action um, compliance decreases, right? So um, the gray line is now instead of zero, it's, it's higher than zero. And when we give a both, uh, then again, we're kind of trying to capture the best of both worlds here. Um, so here we're interested in the effect of numeracy. So we classified uh, people into kind of high numerate and low numerate people based on the number of questions that they got correct. And um, in uh, okay, so in this in this regression, what we see is that um, actually in this regression we just had the number one through seven, but in, in the in the following one we started classifying them. You can see that uh, you know the coefficient for numeracy is positive and significant in all four treatments. So overall. Uh, people do better, so, 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 so people who have higher numeracy, they do better in this experiment, and they um, comply with the forecast better also. So they follow the forecast more than, um, you know, so the higher the numeracy, the, the more likely people are to follow, um, you know, the advice or the recommendation that comes from the probability or calculating, you know, the. Uh, optimal solution when they're given probability but no recommendation. And this is true in all of the, um, in all four treatments. Okay, so uh, 
now uh, I jumped ahead a little bit, but now we classify people as uh, low numerate and high numerate based on the number of questions they got right. And now we're, um, what I'm uh, showing you are, are the graphs where on the x-axis we have the probability um, um, the probability of a loss and on the y-axis uh, the proportion of subject who take the status quo and we see that in the you know in the baseline the high numerate subjects so high numerate are the blue line the high numerate subject look like overall they um, do the right thing a little bit more often than low numerate subject the differences are not huge uh, and in the probability treatment the graph looks like this right so remember x-axis is not period anymore it's the probability so here they knew the probability right in the baseline they didn't know the probability so you wouldn't have expected there to be any difference you know and there weren't so in the probability um, treatment the optimal solution is is this is, is the dotted line here right so when probability gets to 75 percent you should switch from uh, you know from uh, status quo to a siren that's what you should do so it should you should see this kind of a, a big a jump uh, what we're seeing is a much more gradual jump right and so kind of the, the likelihood of people uh, taking you know the siren action increases as probability increases right so rather than so it's sort of flipping at 75 percent it kind of it goes gradually and now if you think about this problem right so if i told you that the probability of a loss you know is 90 percent it's pretty clear what to do right if i told you that it's 10 percent it's also pretty clear what to do the problem becomes more difficult when you know the probability is in these intermediate levels uh, because you know you have to calculate you know you have to do the calculation here they don't have the recommendation and then also you have to decide you know in terms of your utility there is risk aversion involved right so, so, so you have to sort of compare your utility from the two solutions so it's a more difficult problem and um, risk aversion really it can't completely explain it at the individual level. So each individual, if, if risk aversion um, were, uh, was the full explanation, then for every individual, we would see, you know, still this uh, abrupt behavior, but the breakpoint would be, you know, in a different place. So it may not be at 0.75, it may be at 0.8, you know. And so, well, I'm showing you here the aggregate picture, but at the individual level, it also looks like this, right? So we don't see, at the, when we look at the data at individual level, we're still seeing this gradual change as opposed to an abrupt change. So risk aversion probably plays some role, but it doesn't explain the whole result. Okay, uh, we uh, debriefed people, so we asked them an open-ended question um, uh, at the end of the, of the study, and uh, we asked them uh, how did they go about making their decision. And so this is a word cloud of the, res um, of the answers that we got uh, from the probability treatment, and we can see that what's prominent here is discussion of 50%. Right, and the discussion of risk and the discussion of probability, right? And these are just some examples, right? So if P was below 50%, I took the risk. If over 50, I took the cost, right? And if it was above 50%, then I would typically take the cost. So notice here, they're using 50% instead of 75%, right? So the right number would have been 75%, but they're using the 50%. So about 46% uh, of people indicated that they were using this 50-50 rule explicitly in their answers, uh, which is the wrong rule. Um, now, when we uh, 
yeah, don't show people probability, but give them recommendation, what we see is that the high numerate people are doing much better in terms of um, following this recommendation, right? So in, 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 in terms of following the status quo, they are, uh, you know, they're pretty much following the status quo 100% of the time. Low numerate people, not so much. But the, uh, the siren action, there is no difference in the behavior of high and low numerate people. Um, and um, it's obviously the performance is worse right, than when we're giving them probability. Uh, and we, uh, again, we see the cry-wolf effect here. So basically, um, so these are the, the variables we use, right, so the zero one for the siren action and then the, uh, the round and the interaction. And then the number of past mistakes is what measures the cry-wolf effect. And so what we see is that uh, you know, the coefficient on the siren action and past mistakes is negative and significant. And the status quo action and past mistakes is positive and significant, right? And then when we add uh, the interaction with numeracy, we see that it's positive and significant for um, uh, siren action and negative and significant for status quo. So what this is telling us is that um, high, uh, people with high numeracy are more tolerant of um, past mistakes of the forecast, right? So that's what past mistakes mean is when the forecast was wrong, right? Which it's, it's going to be wrong some number, you know, s s some percentage of the time because there is uncertainty. Okay, so high numerate people are more willing to accept the fact that um, sometimes recommendations are wrong. Uh, and then uh, the, so this is for um, uh, siren and status quo, past mistakes, right? And then this is just the baseline for numeracy. So in general, um, highly numerate people are um, less likely to take um, uh, to take the status quo action right in this um, in this game once we control for um, for everything else okay um, all right so this is uh, I showed you the probability and the recommendation condition and then this is the both condition so you see that uh, this 50/50 uh, uh, decision rule that we observed in probability, it went away when we did not show the probability, and then it, it appeared again when we showed it, right? But uh, now uh, in, the, in the siren action region, uh, people are doing better. Okay, so this was, um, these are the word clouds for the different um, treatments, like so for the baseline, you know, it's kind of all over, they talk about lost cost, risk, already showed you the probability. Uh, in the recommendation, they talk about advice, right? So they talk about risk and advice, right? So those are the main things. And then they talk about the 50% again in, um, you know, in the both conditions. So basically showing people probabilities is kind of pushing them towards the 50-50 rule, which is not the right, um, the right rule. And, uh, okay, so I'm finishing. Uh, so, okay. The last part is, you know, can we potentially design um, a scheme that would uh, work better than both, um, you know, that would take kind of the, uh, the effect, um, uh, that would have the benefit of both probability and recommendation and try to get rid of this 50-50 bias. So uh, what we're showing here is the, um, in, in, in our four treatment, the status quo and the siren action, uh, the high numerate and, and, and low numerate people, um, essentially their willingness to take it. So the, uh, we, we see that uh, there is a difference in the recommendation condition. Um, Again, the high numerate people are much more likely to take um, the status quo action 
in the recommendation condition. Um, all right, so we like this, right? So what we are hoping to do is come up with a, with a scheme that would capture that as well as that, right? So uh, that would capture compliance with the status quo as well as the recommendation condition and the compliance with the siren action as well as the both condition or, or the probability condition, actually. This is um, very similar. Yeah. Well, so like in real life, if if uh, you know if there is a hurricane warning, then uh, the status quo would be to stay home, right? And the the siren action would be to evacuate, right? So if if the um, uh, you know if the advice is to evacuate, uh, that would be kind of the example of a recommendation. Uh, but typically, you don't see like the uncertainty information as much for something like this. Well, because the recommendation may be to not evacuate. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, there are other examples, um, you know, that we can come up with if we, uh, I mean, in healthcare, I mean, if we think about, uh, about the pandemic, right, so wearing a mask would be a siren action, and not wearing a mask is a status quo action, because we generally don't wear a mask unless somebody tells us so, uh, but when, um, you know, when when the probability of the infection is low, then we don't wear a mask anymore. And that was the recommendation at one point. Okay, so, um, all right, so this is the better design scheme. The idea here is that uh, we, um, we give people a recommendation. Um, so when the recommendation is to keep, uh, to keep the status quo, we just give people recommendation. We don't give people probability. But when the recommendation is to take the siren action, we give them both. So we essentially, we provide probability as a justification for recommending the siren action, right? So, uh, you know, you should evacuate because this hurricane is, you know, a class five. Right, or you should, uh, you know, start wearing a mask again, you know, because there is a new uh, variant, you know, of COVID that is very contagious. Right, so when there is a siren action, providing recommendation actually improved performance. Um, so this is uh, um, overall, and 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 this is the low and high numerate. So, in general, we see that high numerate people comply more than low numerate people. Um, okay, so um, I'm on time. So, uh, our original hypothesis had to do with how uh, high numeracy, uh, the effectiveness of probability information, um, and the hypothesis was that you know high numerate people are going to be better at using probability information right so that's uh, that makes sense because they can multiply you know they're better at multiplying you know uh, two numbers together but the result is not that our result is in fact high numerate people are better at following recommendations because they are more tolerant of uh, forecast errors that they observe. They're less subject to the cry-wolf effect. So that, I think, is an important uh, uh, insight. Uh, providing probability triggers the 50-50 rule of thumb, at least in, now in this simple game it does. Uh, in the real world, it may be some other rule of thumb that it might trigger. Uh, highly numerate people trust recommendations more, as it's already said and probability forecast chased out recommendations. So when um, we give probability, then it sort of overwhelms the recommendation. So people are using this 50-50 rule in spite of the recommendation. Uh, providing explanation for the siren action works well, 
for high numerate people, not for low numerate. So that's my talk. I'll take questions. <laughs> Thank you for thank you for a really nice talk. Um, I'm curious. We just went through this pandemic where we actually didn't know the probabilities. So I'm curious, what do you think would happen whenever there is kind of uncertainty about how much uncertainty there is? Uh, well, I think that's a that's a very good question, and um, I mean, in, often in the real world you don't, right? So this is sort of a first step you know, uh, to, to, to see what happens when we do know the probability. I think what was happening with the pandemic is that we were learning more about probability as time went on. So the forecast became better, but because it was bad in the beginning, uh, people, a lot of people lost faith in it and stopped following it, right? Now, I'm not sure exactly what could have been done about that, uh, but I think that's what was going on is there was this cry wolf effect in that and, and, and the reason is that forecast wasn't very good because it was, you know, a, a new a new phenomena and we needed time to, to understand it better. So, uh, yeah, so I think that, uh, you know, it's an excellent, excellent point. So you had mentioned numeracy as a sort of a bell curve, and I was curious how you define the high and the low numeracy groups. Is that a, a median split, or are you taking like the lowest tails of that? So there were seven questions. So people who answered um, three, three or fewer are low numerate, and people who answered and answered more than three are high numerate. That's how we classified them. Uh, we did, you know, classify them in, in different ways. It's basically the same result. So it's, it's pretty robust in terms of classification. <laughs> okay, I, I study aging, so my question is uh, very selfish. <laughs> Yeah, so many, many of the people that have power in our society are, and, and are making these very consequential decisions are older adults. And I noticed your sample was relatively young, so I'm wondering if you think that there are any changes in, in these biases or these preferences as people get older. Well, I mean, people who are making decisions are the whole population, aren't they? Well, <laughs> no, so perhaps, uh, you know, the experts are older, right? And the experts are the ones using the models and, and understanding a lot more than the population. So I don't know, you know, what the age will be. I think, I mean, our focus was on the end users, and I think end users are the whole population. Now, it may be that in certain cases, you know, decisions are more consequential for older people. And of course, uh, yeah, I, I don't know whether old people are more numerate or not. Uh, I, is there any uh, results on that? <laughs> yeah. Um, we can take an online question. Mm -hmm. This is um, coming in from the Q&A. Do you have any thoughts on the type of diagrams that are being used for weather forecasting, like a hurricane path, if if a visual image, I suppose, has some likely effect of either insulating people from that cry wolf or changing the way they answer? I, I think that these diagrams that, for example, are shown, you know, for hurricanes, it's kind of like providing probability information, right? Because it's more complicated. Uh, than just a number, and I think that's what the purpose of them is. So in that sense, I think uh, they are effective. Uh, there is also not a 50-50, you know, a bias in something like this. So, uh, I mean, I, th I think that providing recommendation together with this type of diagram is a really good idea. I mean, I think it should improve compliance. 
Yeah. So when you talk about giving the probability uh, and then also just a, a telling someone what to do, a recommendation, mm -hmm. do you feel like that it's which one would be better to guess at? If if I tell, give you a recommendation and it's wrong, do you feel like the loss of trust is more painful than a wrong probability? Yes, I think that's exactly what why. Um, I mean, I mean that was the original hypothesis is that if you, especially when it's a recommendation to do the siren action, right? So the siren action. You know, so, so, so to do something you would not ordinarily do, such as wear a mask or evacuate. So if that recommendation is wrong, then that is what's causing, you know, the cry wolf effect. And so that is really what should be mitigated. And do you look at how much the probability and the recommendation are in line with each other? If I will, that because most of the recommendations, people are experts and they're trying to use probability to make recommendations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when there's a disconnect between those versus more of a connection. That may well be. So in our, in our case, our recommendation was based on probability. So recommendation was always the optimal solution. It was very simple. Uh, so yes, so I, I don't know the answer. I think that... Uh, it's probably it would, 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 would make things worse, but that's just a guess. So what would you do on the weather today when people are worried about the storm and they're saying it's a high probability that everyone needs to get home quickly? What should we do, the probability, or recommend? What would you say? Well, I think that some kind of probability would be a good idea because we're talking about a siren action, right? So going home right now would be a siren action, right? Because either, you know, we would generally stay at work until whatever, five or six, right? So, yes, offering probability, you know, of a, of a hurricane would be a good idea, yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, excellent talk. Uh, let's go ahead and wrap up. We have, um, of course, the, the Brain Health Project is the landmark large-scale study. If you're interested in participating, we have a QR code which you can follow to do so. And uh, we'll be back on November 18th. Well, we're here from Bill Dower, who leads the O'Donnell Brain Institute. So if you're interested in that, we'll see you later this month. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>